Hello, BookTube. Uh, from both of us, and <laughs> me and that little raccoon face sticking out from underneath the curtain. <laughs> uh, I went to the Brattle Bookshop early this morning because there was rain in the forecast. <laughs> That's all the flimsy excuse I need. There was rain in the distant forecast. when I, At 7 this morning, there was rain in the forecast for 4 or 5 tonight. <laughs> I thought, well, rain is technically coming, <laughs> so I'll go to the Brattle. And those of you who might be new to the channel might not know what I'm talking about and wonder why that makes a difference. The Brattle is a used bookstore in Boston, and the weather does make a difference. Because in addition to the stuffed used bookstore full of great staff and tons and tons of books, there's also a sale lot outdoors. That's, it's not just one barrow or shelf of books that they put out there on clearance. It's a whole lot, thousands and thousands of books for $1, $3, or $5. And they wheel those carts inside and tarp over the ones that won't fit inside when it rains. So if going to the Brattle when it's raining, you still get a great bookstore experience. But for me, I check the weather. <laughs> Definitely, I check the weather. Because I don't want to go if the carts are going to be covered. If the sale lot's going to be closed, then I don't want to go. And it was open this morning. <laughs> I got there first thing, and I found a pile of books. I thought we'd just go over them, keeping in mind what I always say about the Brattle, which is that this is an incremental process, like a wave coming in and going out, coming in and going out, a wave coming in and going out. I'm not expecting to keep all of these books. Quite a few of them I know for sure I won't be keeping. I, I'm not expecting to keep all of these books. I don't need to make room for them. I actually do at the moment have tons of room for books, but... I don't need that room. In fact, I need less, I need more of that room because I need fewer books. That can definitely be true right alongside getting a ton of books at the Brattle because I don't know how many of these things I'm going to keep. A couple of these things I am sure are keepers, but only a couple out of a gigantic pile. So let's go through what I got in the fading light of the day with rain coming on. And the first thing we'll do is a giant stack of mass market paperbacks. Which, again, might seem a little odd, because I've mentioned before that I increasingly find mass market paperbacks a little bit inhospitable. They are more fragile than I want. They are the, a little bit tougher on the eye to read, some of, in the print in some cases. They very much are the first casualties in the love that I have for e-reading, which only grows greater every day. <laughs> because an e-reader is the dimension of a mass market paperback. Most of them are the dimension of a mass market paperback, you're essentially using, that's the tactile experience, is that you've got a mass market paperback in your hand. But the font is any size that you want it to be, and it is indestructible. It's not just that it's durable, it's indestructible. That electronic file, if you have it in six different places and on a thumb drive, you've got it for a long, long time. It's, it's, it's bits and data. It's not paper and, and drying, desiccating glue. <laughs> And that has, you would think that mass market paperbacks would be the first casualty. But when I see a gigantic pile of mass market paperbacks for a dollar a piece, I'm going to go nuts. And I did. And one of the reasons that I went nuts was actually there are two reasons. And they are booktube related. There is a current booktube event. And a booktube event going on right now. I'm one of the co-hosts, even though I'm cruelly ignoring the thing. I should be making a, a New World's November video every day. New World's November was created by the Bookish Bryants. To, to, this is the second year that it's been going on to celebrate science fiction. I should be making a video every day. And instead, for some reason, I'm not. I will try to pick up the pace for the rest of November. November is still fairly young. Not in terms of nonfiction, of NaNoWriMo, but in terms of everything else, I, I could still get 20 videos in. But New World's November automatically has me thinking of science fiction. So, and there were a bunch of science fiction novels, so I, I got them even though they were mass market paperbacks, especially since a lot of these are things that I don't think are ever going to exist as an ebook, and I'm never going to see them reprinted in any other format. But also there's another booktube event that was on my mind solely because of the gigantic treasures on offer at the Brattle, and that is June on the Range, which of course was created by Michael K. Vaughn. It had its inaugural inst installation this year, all about Westerns. Just let's read some Westerns. Let's have some fun. Let's talk about Westerns, what they are and what they aren't, why the, the genre, the subgenre of fiction has sort of gone away, and wh what, whether or not some of those reasons are good and maybe some of those reasons are bad. It was great. It was a great event. Fantastic. And, of course, when I saw a bunch of Westerns, I thought, well, you could stock up for next June. If June on the range returns, I'll have plenty. So let's go through... 
let's go through those first. Or no, let's start with historical fiction. Uh, I don't think the Brooks Bryants have done a historical fiction mini event yet. They've, they've hit a lot of the subgenres. I don't think they've done that. I love historical fiction. Absolutely love it. And I found two today, two old uh, paperbacks with the, you know, the rationed paper and whatnot that probably won't survive or reread each of them. But I've had both of these before. And I've read both of them before, but it's been a long, long time in both cases. The first one is by F. Van White Mason. This is Lysander, the famous, this is an ancient paperback here. It's, these are not even, I don't know if I can show you an example. No, I don't have an example, but these are smaller. They're shorter than a normal paperback, than what we consider to be a normal paperback. I'll line it up with some of the ones that I have that are later in this hall. But this thing came out... Uh, 1957. And it's the story of the, the famous Spartan general who, who won uh, <laughs> the, uh, who won against the Greeks in a famous set-piece battle. And he has a wonderful life in Plutarch that I know backwards and forwards. I remember reading this thing and thinking, boy, the author knows that life in Plutarch backwards and forwards too. There's a lot of other research here, but this is just wonderful. I don't think it's ever been reprinted. I think it's largely forgotten, and I pretty sure there's no there's no ebook of it i've had it before i read it once before i think i read it in the 70s so now i have it again same thing with this next one this is by ralph graves and it is the lost eagles the guys the cover scratched up in a few places here but this is the story of uh, a kinsman to quintilius virus who was an otherwise competent Roman general who had the worst day of his life at the very worst time in the Tudorburg Forest and was attacked. He and his legions were almost wiped out, almost to, a la to the last man. And the Imperial Eagles, the standards of the legion, were captured by the German tribesmen who, who killed a lot of Varus's men, who put a lot of others in cages and burned them alive. They also took the eagles. And for a long time, if you believe Suetonius, for a long time afterwards, the Emperor Augustus would would wander the halls of his palace saying out loud, Quintilius Varus, give me back my eagles, <laughs> because he blamed Varus. And in this book, a kinsman of Varus vows to go into the wilds of Germany or Germania or whatever it takes to get those eagles back. <laughs> when it, In fact, it's it's a more humdrum story of their eventual, the eventual rediscovery of part of that, of that lost valor. Okay. So those are the two historical things, ancient Rome and ancient and ancient Sparta. And I'll be happy. I'll be happy to read. I've read both of these before. I'll be happy to read them again. And probably these volumes won't survive. So again, these two won't be swelling the ranks of the books that I have here. I will read them and they will fall apart. Then we have Westerns. I got uh, five westerns because I simply couldn't help myself. I simply couldn't help myself. I found, and a lot of these things, I'm, I'll be wondering. One thing I learned, one thing I noticed in uh, June on the Range, which a lot of you, a lot of you are more familiar with westerns than I am. Maybe you knew this ahead of time. Is that you'll encounter a western, in what looks like an ordinary dime a dozen, literally a dime for the on the price, a dime a dozen paperback, and. You you know, the author's name won't be familiar to you at all unless it's Louis the Moore or Zane Grey. And you will look up the author and they have 200 books. They, they never stop writing Westerns. And I'm wondering how many of these things that will be true for. I'm not going to examine any of these. I'm not going to read any of these until June. It's very rare. Most of the books that are here at Hyde Cottage are either already read or are right on the chopping block. But I'm going to leave these aside so that I have Westerns to fall back on in June on the Range. The first one is by Barry Cord, and it is called The Third Rider. And this also is a smaller paperback. I'll show you what I mean when we get to a larger paperback. This is a smaller one. A little bit of a confusing cover there. You've got a, a clapboard, you know, Western village there, but they're on either a lake or the ocean. And these guys are floating up above them. I don't know why that is. I think it's, it would have been easy to reconcile the elements of this thing. What have we got here? Five years of hard times have left their mark on Mel Rollins. He had left the stir-up ranch a boy and come back a man. Bitter, tough, gun-easy, and law-shy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not going to fight with any of these things. But I, that's, that was one of the main, the main lessons that I learned from June on the Range 2022, was don't fight with these things. If you don't fight with them, you'll enjoy them. Then we have uh, a book by Phil Ketchum. I have to confess, 
It was the cover that got me on this one. I've never seen a Western cover like this. I've now looked at thousands of Western covers, thanks to June on the Range. This is by, it's called Harsh Reckoning. He had to prove who he was, or he'd be outlawed by death. And look at the cover. No gunfight, no horses, no old town, no nothing like that. It's just two men viciously grappling with each other. What a weird cover. I love it. But I, I don't get it at all. And uh, here's what I'm talking about. This is a normal size mass market paperback. And if we line these up on the corner, this is not. These are There's a technical term for this. This is a smaller paperback. This is exactly Kindle size. And this is slightly bigger. So what have we got here? Brand had been illegally jailed in a Mexican prison for five vicious years. Deb caused that for us a couple of times. Non-consecutively. Uh, he hadn't heard from anybody in all that time, and he had figured everyone, including his wife, probably thought he was dead. So he didn't imagine there'd be much left of his ranch. It hadn't amounted to a hill of beans anyway. He'd just have to start over once he got back. Okay. <laughs> You've got these. I want to see this scene. I wonder where in the book it's going to occur. Then we have uh, some, something by David King. Again, if I look this guy up, probably has 300 books. His name. I've never heard of him before. This is called Outlaw Doc. A far more conventional cover, a man on a horse with men pursuing, but I love the, the uh, reflection in the water down there. That, that's extremely well designed. It's like I mentioned a couple of times during June on the Range this summer. I don't think old, these old vintage westerns really get the credit they deserve for the artwork on the cover. Some of the covers that I have seen are lovely. Absolutely, that's not always going to be true with these as one particular, but some of them are absolutely lovely. That is, that is just a lovely painting. Uh, what have we got here? Once Peter Lodge had been a reputable New York doctor. Now he was just another drifter with a price on his head. Against his will, he found himself riding across the Western Territory with the most vicious gang on the Badlands, wanted for a murder he didn't commit. Shades of Jake Spoon. <laughs> but Lodge didn't have time to protest his innocence. He had his life to worry about. He had a tender. He was a tenderfoot who didn't even have a gun. One long move, and he was a dead man. Sounds unconventional. Uh, we shall see. In due time, we shall see. Then we have something by Veckel Howard. Again, probably has three hundred books. Probably had ten movies made out of his works. This is is uh, called Tall in the West. Very conventional Western cover. There. And sketchy to the point where it is not particularly attractive. What, what do we have here? He walked as though the ground under his feet belonged especially to him. It was hard to tell what he was or what he had been. It was almost as though he were a new breed of man. There were bigger men and more powerful looking men, but rarely did they combine that bigness and power with the grace and coordination that this man had. Okay, all right, so, all right, so well, I guess he's the hero then, right? Because <laughs> he's really big. <laughs> so, we'll give it a try, you never know. And then there was this thing, I absolutely could not leave this behind. We will we will dispense for the moment with any talk of nice covers. But this is by a guy named Clarence Mulford, and it's called Tex. And the cover here, it says a couple of interesting things, a couple of things that I want to research. This is the book. <laughs> You got me. <laughs> ah, it's not a very good cover, but it attracted me. And this is also one of those smaller paperbacks. See, but the cover has two interesting things on it. First, it says abridged edition. Why would it say abridged edition? Where is the unabridged edition? Why? I've never seen a Western that called itself the abridged edition. And the other is author of Hopalong Cassidy. I read that on the way back from the battle. I read that and thought, well, so did he write a novel about Hopalong Cassidy? And then the thought occurred to me, well, wait a minute. Hopalong Cassidy is a fictional character. Did this guy maybe invent Hopalong Cassidy? I don't believe that. I th surely Hopalong Cassidy is something like Zorro where, you know, it's, I was going to say something like Zorro in that it's faded. It's become a kind of cultural common domain, but Zorro was invented by an individual person, so maybe Hopalong Cassidy was too, and maybe Clarence Mulford is that person. But what about that abridged version? Where is the unabridged version? Unless, the only thing I think of now that I think about it is that maybe he wrote this as an endless serialization, and then cobbled a book together from it, in which case he would call this the abridged version, because fans of the, of the endless serialized edition would notice the parts that were left out. Uh, I don't know. I, again, it would take research. I'm not going to research this until the time comes. This came out in 1949. So, baby, stop it. 
the licking. Stop licking, baby girl. Um, okay, so those, we have mass market paperbacks. We did Frida. Frida, stop licking, baby girl. She's just getting in the zone of licking. Uh, we did historical fiction. Then we did uh, westerns. And now we will do science fiction and fantasy. I got another ton of mass market paperbacks of science fiction and fantasy. We'll start with, I believe there's only one fantasy here. Yes. Yeah, there's only one fantasy. And I've had this before. I got it when it when it first came out in uh, the 1990s. Yes, 1990. Uh, and I read it and I kind of liked it. I thought it was really smart, but just not a little deficient in drama. And it's been all that time. It's been that whole time since I read it. So I will give it another try. I seem to be on a bit of a, a bit of a roll with the Brattle in terms of, it sounds brutal to say, but second or maybe even third rate fantasy authors that I, I the Brattle is just, you know, offering me another try at. This is Dave Duncan, and this is his book, Magic Casement. This is book one of A Man and His Word. Um... Uh, I remember this as being pretty fo pretty pro forma epic fantasy. So we shall see. Does it say here? Princess Enos lived an idyllic life in her father's sleepy backwater kingdom. Krasnagar was a peaceful kingdom, and Enos was a friend to all, especially her childhood companion, the stable boy Rap. Then one day, a god appeared with an enigmatic warning that might m mean that Enos should wed. No one was sure, but who could ignore a divine warning? And as no eligible nobleman ever visited tiny Krasnagar, Enos found herself exiled to the Empire to learn to be a lady. Thus Enos was far away when Rap's strange talents began to emerge, and the townsfolk whispered darkly of magic. Then the king fell ill, and Rap set out to warn Enos to prepare to claim her birthright, but Rap couldn't know he was that as he struggled through goblin infested wastes, that he was on a journey ordained by the gods since the world since before the world began. See, I remember thinking, you know, it's a fairly standard chosen one thing, but I remember liking how it was done. I'll give it another try. But that was that was fantasy, and then all the rest of this is science fiction. This first one, I'm not so sure. This is A. Bertram Chandler. That name rings a bell. And this is the Hamlin Plague. And that name ought to will signify already what the gory cover is going to be because of the Pied Piper of Hamlin. Uh, and who, the, with the original pretext of the story is that Hamlin wants him to get rid of the, the rats that are infesting the town. And that's why you have a big garish rat on the cover here. Uh, but let's let's find out what the Hamlin plague is. This this thing came out in 1963. <laughs> and the dedication is for my fat cat. That's how the book is dedicated, for my fat cat. Uh, and for, interestingly, in, in 1963... The cover art is credited. It's by Bob McGuire. Uh, what we, it began with a few small items in the newspapers. Dead dogs and cats, a mutilated child, a series of unexplained fires. Then suddenly it exploded into full-size catastrophe. Huge mutants, half rat, half man, <laughs> began to take over the world, stealing children for slaves and destroying whole cities and their populations. That's not how mutation works but that's okay. Uh, only a few people escaped, among them Tim Barrett, his wife Jane, and a handful of survivors. Alone on the high seas in a small ship, they set off to find the island where Dr. Theodore Piper had been experimenting with a sonic death ray. They knew Dr. Piper was their only hope for personal and world survival, if he was still alive, if the King Rats hadn't forced him to serve their evil purpose, and if he could find a way to stop the spreading horror of invasion. So... King rats are <laughs> invading the world. Uh, then we have this thing. Oh my god, this thing's falling apart. There's no, it's literally falling apart. There's no way this will read more than once. This is by uh, Jack Williamson and James Gunn. And here the cover hum helpfully tells me that this is unabridged. <laughs> Probably I'll wish that it were. This is Starbridge. Again, in one of these smaller mass market books. So. It's a smaller thing, and the page is already tufting out, so this I'll read this once, and it'll fall apart as I read it. Uh, it was the greatest empire of them all, spanning light years, gathering in the stars with a golden net. World after world, star after star, all were snared together in a web of shimmering golden tracery. Each gleaming strand was a tube, and the communications that turned the harsh metallic planet of Aeron into the empire, a bridge between the, the stars, 
flung across the wide, dark rivers of space. Okay, I get it. Oh, that's it. <laughs> that's all we're going to get. Starbridge. Okay, so there are pneumatic tubes connecting planets. Okay, we shall see. Uh, this is These were inspired by New World's November. Uh, then we have uh, Murray Leinster. Apparently, I'm going to have a lot of Murray Leinster. There are certain authors I just can't seem to avoid, and he seems to be one of them. This, I admit, I got for the cover, which is kind of thick and brooding in a way that I, I wasn't quite expecting. This, I wonder if this will credit the author or the artist. Let's see. This is from 1954, and it does not credit the cover artist. But this is called Operation Outer Space. Something about the the way, you know, see, you've got this right here, right? Something about this cover, the way none of the main characters are looking at the reader. It's just sort of, it's like we're looking at them involved in their own work. I I like it. You've got the stereotypical spaceship in the background there. I can't wait to, to give this a try. And thanks to New World's November, I will be reading into a lot of this science fiction right away. This will not be going on a shelf and waiting. Let's see here. The ship swayed again. Flying creatures darted back and forth above the treetops. Miles away, insensate violence reigned. Clouds of dust and smoke shot miles into the air. Half a mountainside glowed white hot, and there was the sound of long-continued thunder as the ground shook and quivered. The runaway spacecraft's rockets bellowed as it lifted, hovering for an instant. It surged skyward. The ship vanished into emptiness. Jed Cochran stared helplessly at the spot where it had stood. Babs gasped suddenly. She realized the situation in which she and Cochran had been left. Shivering, she pressed close to him as a distant trail of blackened smoke spread toward the center of the sky. They were alone and together among the stars. She is conspicuously absent on this cover. Operation Outer Space sounds like absolutely standard cheese science fiction. I will give it a try. For a dollar, I will give it a try. Then we have, this is an anthology. Yes, this is an anthology from uh, 1965. And this is called Rulers of Men. Edited by Hans Stefan Santeson. Rulers of Man. Look at that Art Deco artwork. Someone says, do it, and someone else does it. That's government. Anytime, anyplace. So I guess this will be about alien regimes rather than alien monsters. Who we got in here? Robert Block. Uh, be of Good Cheer, Fritz Leiber. That's great. I've read that before. This Majesty of Earth by Arthur Clarke. I've read that. Uh, A Thing of Custom by L. Sprague de Camp. I read that. I think that's in the best of L. Sprague de Camp. Prison Break by Miriam Allen DeFord. I have not read that. The Eyes Have It, Randall Garrett. That is in the, the old Timescape, best of Randall Garrett. That's great. Fantastic. I've read it. Boy, this is a good list. Murderer's Chain by Wenzel Brown. I've never read that. I don't think I've ever heard of that author. Fall of Night by Bertram Chandler. We saw Bertram Chandler, Yes. Bertram Changer and A. Bertram Changer have got to be the same person. Right? They've got to be. What are the odds? <laughs> How can there be two parents so cruel? <laughs> That's got to be him, right? So sometimes you went by A. Bertram Chandler, and sometimes you went by just Bertram Chandler. A lot of you will know more than I will. Sean Stanfast will probably know. But I've never read Fall of Night, and it's Fall of Night with a K. Then The K Factor by Harry Harrison. I haven't read that. And The Wolfram Hunters by Edward Hawk, H-O-C-H. -H. Do not know that at all. Oh, this is going to be interesting. It's going to be an interesting anthology. It's too bad it's not going to survive. I don't think any of these things are going to survive or read. Then we have uh, something a little more modern. I think this was probably from the 80s. I remember this. Oh, no, 1967. <laughs> okay. And here are the artwork, the cover artwork is by David Bergen. And this is A Far Sunset. Lovely cover and much newer in sensibility than a lot of these older ones. Edmund Cooper is a weird science fiction author, very, very smart, largely complete, largely forgotten, I would say. I bet a lot of even science fiction aficionados have never read him. Um, I wonder what this is going to tell me. Also weird. He was a weird guy. I guess that helped. That can help you when you're writing science fiction. Maybe that's why I, for instance, find so much of Arthur C. Clarke so boring, because he was so ordinary. <laughs> He's such an ordinary person. Uh, the year is 2032 A.D. Little mistake, always bug Steve. It's something, something, something B.C. But it, after Christ, it's the, the abbreviation that comes first. So it's not 
2032 AD, it's AD 2032. And 2032 is, what, 10 years from now. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's kind of amazing. I'm sure that, that it's not going to, I'm not going to recognize what, 10 years from now, it's pretty easy to guess what the world's going to look like. The Gloria Mundi, a starship built and manned by the new United States of Europe, touches down on the planet Altair 5. Disaster strikes, leaving only one apparent survivor, Paul Marlowe, whose adventures in the lair of a strange primeval race known as the Bayani leads him first to their god, the omnipotent and omniscient Oruri, and eventually to an unlimited power that is so great that it must include a built-in death sentence. Forces that have been remained static for centuries overcome both the forces of the future and the quest for unlimited knowledge. Well, I read some Edmund Cooper. I'm not sure that I've ever read this. If I did, it didn't have this cover. So there you go. That was a blast of science fiction, a blast of westerns, a couple of historicals. The only thing that was missing from the science from the mass market hall at the Brattle this morning were mystery novels. Another of my beloved subgenres. That there were some, but I they I just they never they never actually appealed, so I didn't hoover any of them up. And that is all the mass market paperbacks. And then we can move on to the re the few remaining books in this hall. Like, for instance, I got a Penguin Classic. It's in perfect condition. I think I only have this in a mass market, so I saw it in a trade paper act. The thing about the Brattle is that if you see something and you're not sure, you can just grab it. If you're out in the sale lot, you can just grab it. It's a dollar. It's three dollars. So it's it's not going to put you out if you're wrong. You'll just have a double. And this is, of course, the, the autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, which... Uh, this is the George Bull translation. It's been everywhere. Penguin has reprinted this a million times over a million other people. It is a fantastically entertaining book. If it doesn't look it, if you're not thinking that it does, it's fantastically entertaining. Once you realize that Benvenuto Cellini is a braggart and a liar, then his autobiography dictated to, you know, a, a terrified underling who was afraid of having a wine goblet thrown in his head becomes endlessly entertaining. Uh, I love it. I never, I never pass up an opportunity. I'll probably reread re a chunk of this just on the occasion of getting it at the Brattle, and it will also occasion a search through my Penguin bookcase to see if I actually have this in a in a trade paperback. This is in perfect condition. I guarantee it's in better condition than whatever edition of Penguin that I have, if I have it. Then I found this little thing. This little thing is certainly a keeper. The Benvenuto Cellino is probably a keeper. None of the mass markets are keepers. They not only in the, the most literal sense, in the sense that I don't think a lot of them will survive a read. I'll read them and they will fall apart as I'm reading them. But also in the sense that even if they do survive a read, I'm not going to want to keep them. The Benvenuto Cellini I will certainly keep unless I have this exact thing in a duplicate. I don't need two of this exact perfect condition trade paperback. But these next three I don't have, and I think I want to keep them. The first one is Somerset Mob. For, I think it was Saturday Evening Post, he did a series of long articles about books and reading. And they're wonderfully opinionated. They were they're wonderfully tossed off in the way of an encyclopedic, you know, mega brain can do. Uh, an encyclopedic mega brain will toss off an article, and it won't seem that way. It'll be it'll glitter with brilliance. And he collected them into a book. I knew that he collected them into a book, but I never thought I'd see the book. It's called Books and You. Tiny little thing. And uh, uh, that this is delightful. Absolutely delightful. Never thought I would find this. And it has one of these library dust jacket covers on it too. Can you see to say what was left of the, the paper cover? I have read excerpts from one of those three articles. I've never read this whole thing. I don't think, I mean, it wasn't conceived as a whole thing, but still. And I couldn't help but notice when I was looking through this on the way back, I couldn't help but notice when I was looking at this, I was looking at the table of contents, and I, I was thinking, boy, you know, the one thing that would be great that won't be in a book like this would be an index. The publisher is obviously not going to pay someone to create an index and a bibliography of such a trifle. This, this is meant to be a stocking stuffer for the bookish person on your list in the 1950s. Is that right? Oh, good God, 1940. It, it, it was meant to be an impulse thing, so it's not going to have an index. But I reckon without the absolutely bat crap crazy person who owned it before I did, who went through it with a pink pencil and actually created, I don't know if you can make it out there, actually created an index. There is every, the page where every single one of these writers is mentioned. <laughs> and I can still make it out. Pro the person probably did that 70 years ago. I can still make it out on there, so I'll use that, absolutely. I'll read it through. It's, it's an hour. 
to read through, but I, I will also have handy reference for it. When in the book does mom mention Trollope or Dickens or Balzac or whatever? Uh, this next one, I've never seen it before. It's from 1931. Yeah, I'm sure that it was never reprinted. It's an odd thing. It caught my eye right away. It's an, the New Yorker, the magazine, the New Yorker. I love it. I go way, way back with the New Yorker. I love their cartoons, but I also love the scrappy way that the New Yorker, right from the beginning, they are almost at their their hundred year mark, and right from the beginning, the New Yorker has was pretty scrappily inventive about reprinting a lot of their stuff, figuring that people either didn't have stacks of the old magazine piled up in you know in an attic somewhere, or even if they did have those stacks. Where was I? There is no emergency. Uh, okay, w figuring or, or figuring that even if people did have stacks of the New Yorker, they wouldn't be able to remember where that particular thing they liked was in any one issue or dig it out, that sort of thing. So the New Yorker started a, uh, accommodating people like that, and here is something I never thought I would find. It's called the New Yorker Scrapbook, and it's a collection of prose pieces. So. It's got, uh, obviously, Dorothy Parker will be in here. Let's see Let's see who else is in here. Uh, 1931 is probably too early for uh, a lot of the names that now have become synonymous with the New York. Yeah, Dorothy Parker is all throughout here. E.B. White, Ring Lardner, Robert Benchley. Uh, E.B. White again, Dorothy Parker again, E.B. White again. <laughs> no, John O'Hara is in here. Now, see, John O'Hara was one of the people I was going to think was too... This was too early. Boy, time flies. Yeah, John O'Hara is in here. Dorothy Parker's all over here. Walcott Gibbs is all over here. James Thurber. Okay, so so the, the great original class of the New Yorker. And it starts out, the, the New Yorker has just a, a one one paragraph introduction. This is a singularly straightforward book designed to hurt the feelings of all writers not represented in it without materially adding anything to the happiness of those who are. <laughs> Uh, and so this will be a lots and lots of early prose from the New Yorker. Fantastic. To add to what I realized on the way back here when I was looking at this thing is a fairly sizable New Yorker little library that I have of stuff. I have a big collection of New Yorker short stories, a ton of New Yorker cartoon collections of all kinds. I have a gigantic, beautiful collection of all the New Yorker covers. And now I have one of their scrapbooks. Uh, and then we'll finish up with the, uh, the last book, that I got today and another of the guaranteed keepers. <laughs> this is Hugh Kenner. And this is a collection of his, oh goodness gracious baby. I'm getting tired baby. Oh. Oh, uh, this is a collection of his critical pieces. He is so good as a critic. He is so savage. In a very high Mandarin way, he's the ultimate egghead. But when he rips apart a book, there is no way to put the pieces back together. And this is his book on English writers, which I knew about. I, I love his book on Irish writers. His book on Irish writers is absolute required reading. It's so, so wonderful. But I knew that a book on English writers existed, but I've never seen it. And this is A Sinking Island. And it has oh, just a ton of his work. This was originally... Uh, a review copy, a finished review copy from Knopf, a little, a little sign there. Don't do it like this anymore. Uh, please do not run your review before publication date. We would appreciate receiving two copies of your review. <laughs> uh, nobody has to do that anymore, but this has uh, everybody. I wonder if the, the table of contents will be helpful. We need to get the, the crackpot from this book <laughs> to, to, to do a table of contents from here. I seem to remember that the, the, on these few camera books, the table of contents is not helpful. No, no, it's not helpful. It just has fancy pants titles. But it'll be about, well, all of these figures, right? It'll be about Shaw and Wolf and Kipling and Conrad and T.S. Eliot and whatnot. I, some of these things I've read, some of these pieces I've read, but not all of them. This is going to be wonderful. <laughs> this is going to be, this is going to pull at me when I've got a lot of other reading to do. I imagine that I will read at least one thing in here. There's an essay later in the book called uh, A Knot of Critics. I'll probably read that right away, and then I'll put the rest of the things on hold. But anyway, A Sinking Island, Books and You, A New Yorker Scrapbook, 
the autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, the George Bull translation, and then a ton of mass market paperbacks. Just one after another mass market paperback. Just a stack of them. The only thing missing, since the Brattle doesn't do romance, the only thing missing was mass market murder mysteries. I've got a ton of mass market murder mysteries there over the years, but uh, and there were some, but none of them really appealed to me as much as I got historical fiction, westerns, and science fiction and fantasy. So another another Brattle Hall, lots of fun, dirt cheap, wonderful. Uh, and now, well, the carts are going to be covered. The lot is going to be barren. The rain is coming. <laughs> we'll have some rain for tonight, probably all of tomorrow. Uh, but that's okay, because it's the weekend, and I've got a lot of work to do, so I'm not going back to the Brattle until next week at the very earliest. <laughs> well, I will, we will reconvene then. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.